Hi, this is Pastor Mike with uh, this week's View from the Pew. It's been a very tough week as we've lost uh, 20 little angels in Connecticut. And tonight we go to prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for those lives, for the time that we had with those children. Their time on earth was a blessing to many. Their loss is just that, a tremendous loss to each and every parent. Lord, we hold up to you tonight. Each of those families, the parents, the grandparents, the, the relatives that suddenly, right before Christmas, lost somebody. We think of others that have lost family and friends this year. We hold them up to you. We know that all things happen for a reason. We don't know the reason. We know that you do, and we hold that up in, in faith and trust that you will hold those 20 very close in your laps. And we, we thank you for that. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. And our gospel for the 23rd of December, the fourth Sunday of Advent. Can you believe that already? It's from Luke 1, verses 39 to 55. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a, a town in the hill country of Judea where she entered Zachariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. My sermon tonight is entitled, Jesus, Joshua, and 20 Angels in Connecticut. There's a book entitled, Barren Couples and Broken Hearts. It's about married couples who desperately want to have children but for one reason or another are unable to it's one of life's ironies isn't it some couples have unexpected and unwanted pregnancies other couples who are totally unfit to be parents have absolutely no trouble breeding then there are those couples with so much love to give, but are denied the opportunity. Last week, we saw children, little angels shot to death, despite the fact that they had parents that loved them. That love was so obvious this week as the funerals began. Of course, children are a challenge. I read a true story about a family who lived on the 42nd floor of a high-rise on the lakefront in Chicago. Each morning the two-year-old son kissed his father goodbye as his father stepped into the elevator, which was located just outside the door of their apartment. Every night the boy waited to jump into his father's arms as he stepped back out of that same elevator. It was only later that the boy learned to express himself clearly that the family learned that for many, many months, the little boy thought that his dad spent his entire day, every day, in that elevator. Life is quite interesting from a child's perspective. Not everyone in our society wants to be a parent, but that's okay. No one ever should be made to feel unworthy because they made that choice. But there are some couples who want desperately to have a child. 
often they are some of the best people in the world. They're able both financially and emotionally to be the very best parents. But nature does not cooperate. Some will choose adoptions. Some will choose to focus on each other and just accept their childless state. Elizabeth and Zachariah fit in this latter category. They were a totally devoted couple, devoted to God and to one another. They had given up long ago about having a son or a daughter. They had reached an age that, that would seem totally unrealistic. They had learned to cope with it. God knew best, they believed. Then one day, the most extraordinary thing happened. The angel Gabriel appeared to Zechariah and announced that he and Elizabeth would have a son. This in itself was a tremendous shock, but the angel said something even more extraordinary, that their child was to be the long-awaited messenger who would announce the coming of the Messiah. Zechariah was struck speechless, literally struck speechless. Can you imagine how difficult it was for Zechariah to communicate all this to Elizabeth, especially since he wasn't able to speak. She was to become the mother, a very mature mother. They would have a son, and he would grow up to be a very special man. That night, they surely clung to one another in joy and in disbelief. Elizabeth hid herself away when she discovered she was pregnant. Perhaps she was slightly embarrassed. Certainly she was in no hurry to draw attention to the fact that she was going to be a mother of a very special man. All of her friends were grandmothers, or great-grandmothers possibly, and were preparing to, and here she was preparing to have her own child, her first. It just seemed all too much. Elizabeth did not know that that same angel that had appeared to her also appeared to a relative of hers, a much younger woman, betrothed to a carpenter from Nazareth by the name of Joseph. Elizabeth made that discovery when one day Mary appeared at her door. And Luke tells us something very special about that encounter. He says, the babe leaped in Elizabeth's womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and she exclaimed to Mary blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb Elizabeth announced the coming of Christ what a beautiful story about some very beautiful people perhaps we should note first of all the joy that these two women felt is at that news of their pregnancy. One was yet an unwed mother, the other very mature in her years. Neither would have chosen the timing that, it, that happened with their pregnancies, but both were thrilled at the event. Wouldn't it be great if all children could be greeted with such enthusiasm? Unfortunately, we know better. One of the scandals of our society is the prevalence of child abuse. Over 2.7 million cases of, in America are reported just last year alone. One child dies every four hours from abuse. The cost of, to, the society, or to our society is staggering. Two of every three prisoners convicted of first degree murder report that they were victims of physical abuse themselves. 80% of all prostitutes report a history of sexual abuse. If you're a product of a loving and happy home, then give God thanks each and every day of your life. You may have already received the richest blessing life could possibly bestow. And you have children of your own, make those years count. Sam Levinson tells a wonderful story about the birth of his first child. That first night, 
left home, the baby would not stop crying. His wife frantically flipped through the pages of Dr. Spock to find out why babies cry and what to do about it. Since Spock's book is rather long, the baby cried for a long time. Grandma was in the house, but since she had not read the book on childbearing, she was not consulted. They had to follow Dr. Spock's book. My parents had that book, by the way. The baby continued to cry. Finally, Grandma could be silent no longer. Put down the book, she said to her children, and pick up the baby. Good advice. Put down the book, pick up the baby. Spend time with your children, particularly at Christmas time. We have this mistaken notion that good parents give their children lots of things. That truly is wrong. In a survey done of 15,000 school children, the question was asked, what do you think makes for a happy family? When the kids answered, they didn't say a big house, fancy cars, a boat in the driveway, new video games as their source of happiness. The most frequently given answer was doing things together. Notice the joy with which these women greeted their pregnancy. Notice in the second place how important their faith was to them. Elizabeth and Mary both were selected to give birth to these very special babies because their faith in God. They did not have affluent homes or great educational advantages. All they had was a simple faith. And that's important. Happily families just don't happen. They're part of a package. Some young people may complain that their parents expect way too much of them. They have had too many rules, too many regulations. Maybe their parents are a little bit on the old-fashioned side, a little bit behind the times. Let me clue you in. And these characteristics that make you, it's these characteristics that make you so fortunate. If they were in any other way, they wouldn't be putting their happiness before their own. They wouldn't make sacrifices on your behalf. And they wouldn't surround you with love. That love ever since you first came into the world. Because there are people of strong values, you can rest assured that they'll always be there regardless of what's to come. It's all part of the package. It has to do with commitment that has been made to God, to one another, and to you as children. The family that prays together stays together, they say. As trite as that may sound, it's true. Faith was important to Elizabeth and to Mary. They both trusted in God. Notice, however, that Elizabeth and Mary's faith did not protect them from pain. The story of these two mothers-to-be would not have a happy ending. Both sons met tragic deaths. Elizabeth's son was executed by decapitation. Mary's son died on a cross between two thieves. Both sons were still young men when they died. Can you imagine the heartache of both mothers? As an old Yiddish proverb says, little children disturb your sleep. Big ones disturb your life. To have a little baby implies a big risk. It's the risk of loss. Some of you may know about that loss. Some of you have, may have lost children. For some, it may have happened in infancy. In others, after the child had reached adulthood, regardless of when it happened, it brings indescribable pain, as we saw out of Connecticut. At such times, all, of, all you can do is believe in God, a God who loves you, and whose care is eternal. When we see that loss in Connecticut, we can feel that loss. Then we can only turn to our Father for solace. Marie L. Pemberton lost her beloved four-year-old Jeremy, or I'm sorry, Joshua, to leukemia. Joshua died in June, and as Christmas approached, the pain of loss was still heavy in Maria's heart. She stood at her kitchen window, numbly staring out the window. 
she saw Chris Martin, Joshua's little friend, rolling snowballs and assembling a poor imitation of a snowman across the way. Poor Chris, she thought. He's always always been alone since Joshua died. Marie hadn't seen much or hadn't been there to comfort the boy much. Her grief had been so intense that she could barely look at Chris. For when she did, thoughts of Joshua leaped into her mind. When Chris came to the fence between their backyards trying to get her attention, she ignored him and promptly went back inside. One day when speaking to him, she could hold no longer and he asked her where Joshua was. She mumbled, ask your mother, Chris. She can explain it better than I. After that, Chris didn't want to talk to Marie much. Instead, he would stare at her for a second or two and return to his play. Marie turned away from the kitchen window and resumed her house cleaning. Thank the Lord, her husband Joe had agreed not to go very heavy on Christmas that year. There would be no pine needles to sweep up after, no Christmas tree, no mountain of dishes to wash, no holiday visitors. They would eat out on Christmas Day, and she kept the kitchen curtains drawn so that there would be no reminder of Chris Martin, reminding her of Joshua. Later in the afternoon from the living room window, she was surprised to see Chris's father, George, in the driveway, taking a magnificent evergreen off the roof of his car. It's two weeks before Christmas, she muttered. Do they have to start so early? Never mind the fact that when they had Christmas together, before Joshua's death, they had put up the Christmas tree the day after Thanksgiving. They already got their tree up, Marie told Joe at dinner. I thought you weren't interested in Christmas, he said. I'm not, she said as she went to answer the knock on the door. It was Ellie Martin from next door. Come over and look at our tree, Marie, Ellie said. And I have something else that you've got to see. At Joe's insistence, Marie went over to the Martin house. What would she say to Chris? He, he wondered. But the little boy wasn't about. Marie followed Ellie to the basement den, where the new decorated tree stood in all its magnificence. Doesn't it give you the Christmas spirit, said Ellie. Now, I want you to see this, she continued, as she led Marie to the, the crutch, the nativity scene, and pointed to two baby figures tucked under a blanket in the manger. Chris said, they're baby Jesus and Joshua. Ellie's eyes watered as she continued. Last summer when you sent him back over here to ask me about Joshua, all I told him was that Joshua had gone to heaven to be with baby Jesus. When I placed the Christ child in the crib this afternoon, he ran and got a doll and tucked it in alongside. When I asked him why, he reminded me of what I had told him last summer. Joshua is with Jesus, Marie thought to herself. It sounded and looked so right, and a little child shall lead them, were the words racing through Marie's mind as she went looking for Chris to hug him. For Marie, Christmas had finally arrived. Some of you know the pain that Marie felt, and Mary, and Elizabeth. It may have been the loss of a child, loss of a parent, or a brother, or a sister that saddened you this year. For me, it was the loss of Brenda back in 2007, my wife. She lived, in, lived for Christmas. She was Christmas. She decorated the entire house. It took a couple of years of our marriage with Deborah to heal and to finally place Brenda's ornaments on the tree. 
maybe this Christmas can be that healing time for you in your life. A woman pregnant with her first child late in life was the first person in the New Testament to announce Christ's coming. She and her kinswoman, Mary, looked forward with eagerness to the birth of their children. Wouldn't it be a wonderful story that every birth can be anticipated like that? Mary and Elizabeth were women of faith. Faith is important to family life. There would come a time for both Elizabeth and Mary that they would entrust their sons to God. They knew their children were a gift from God. Regardless of what followed, they knew their children were always in God's care. That was the greatest hope and it's your hope and mine in regard to everyone we love. This Christmas, we entrust not only Joshua to Jesus, but beside Jesus are another 20 little angels for God to take care of. This Christmas, let us affirm our faith in the God of Elizabeth and Mary and their two sons who changed the world. This Christmas, we affirm our faith in God who holds all of us in his hand. We are all his children. And that's this week's View from the Pew. Again, Heavenly Father, we pray for those children and the many children who have lost their lives over the last year. Those children in Connecticut especially and their families, their friends, and their relatives. We hold them especially in your, in your loving hands. We ask this in Jesus' name.